The Higher Education and Research Bill it, and its, um, the accompanying white paper that uh, preceded it, now working its way through Parliament, represents an attempt to turn the English higher education sector into a full-blown neoliberal market-led model for higher education. Companies seeking profits for profit providers will be able quickly and easily to set up universities, recruit unlimited numbers of students, and then claim £9,000 per student in tuition fees per year. Regulations the governing the character of universities will be ripped up and simplified in the interests of those corporations being able to make their profits. And all of this at the expense of existing and future students, existing and future staff, and indeed at the expense of academic freedom. In other words, if one were to look at the Bologna Declaration about the serious threats, the key serious threats to the future of higher education when that was made, both of them are represented by this bill going through Parliament because the Bologna Declaration declared that the major threats to higher education and its future were political intervention by governments and the role of the market in higher education. What I want to do um, is simply to summarise for you the key aspects of that uh, of the higher education bill. I want to do that by taking you through the central elements of it and then leave any of the rhetoric, or most of the rhetoric at least, about the bill to the, to the other speakers. The higher education bill is something that threatens universities. So one of the first things for us to be focused upon, I think, is what it is that we might think that universities are for. And when I was thinking about how to put this together, it struck me that there are three simple and straightforward things which appear in the alternative white paper, which is available outside for those who want to see these arguments in any greater detail. The first is, obviously, the education of the next generation of people who are going to go through to the management of the societies in which we live. Secondly, there's the engaging in research to advance knowledge and to solve both the natural and the social and indeed the historical problems that confront humanity. And lastly, one of the key roles of a university is to preserve its own autonomy, to preserve itself as a space for the independence of precisely that research that it is there to do and the education that it's there to provide. To be free, in other words, of political influence and interference. And if we imagine that those three are not popular, let me assure you that that is not the case. Let me assure you that those who say that universities have no friends are right in one sense. They have few friends, certainly in government circles or in Westminster, but it's not true that they don't have friends in Westminster as a whole, and most importantly, it's not true that universities have few friends amongst the general public, because if you look at the evidence the evidence belies the claims that universities are not supported by the general public. The British Social Attitude Survey consistently shows three things. Massive opposition to student debt. An understanding widespread throughout the community in Britain of education as being valuable well beyond its capacity to provide qualifications for future jobs. And thirdly, an appreciation that the greatest obstacle to the fulfillment of opportunity amongst each generation is social inequality with the implication that access to higher education for their children is what parents want in order to overcome the problems of inequality that confront them and to enhance their opportunity. That commitment to a public higher education system which is repeated again and again and again in successive high, um, <coughs> social attitudes surveys is indeed strongest not amongst those who graduated with degrees or who work at universities or who are current students. It's amongst those without graduate level qualifications. In other words, those who would have liked to have been at university but never made it. Now the bill that's going through Parliament is a threat to all of the things that that public 
aspires to. And I've identified, and I'm speaking very quickly because there's little time, what those are. A deregulation of the sector, open it up, opening it up to for-profit for riders. An entrenchment of the high debt regime for students. A differentiation and a polarization of the higher education sector into high fee and high quality institutions on the one hand and low fee, low quality degree courses on the other. And that will have an effect socially. It will increase the inequality in society and it will reduce social mobility. It will constitute a severe damage to communities such as the communities here in Brighton and Hove that hosts universities as the impact and implications of this bill work itself out. It will produce a marginalization of independent student voices. Students' unions will be undermined as the government is intent at the moment of trying to undermine the influence of the National Union of Students. It will distort research by the funding mechanisms that it intends to put in place. And it will provide for the first time since 1918, the first time since 1918, an opportunity for the government to have a direct voice in arguing about what it is that research councils should devote money to for the purposes of research. And finally, it will have exactly the opposite effect on teaching quality that the government claims. It will cause it to deteriorate. Deregulation, deregulation takes in the first instance the form of a redefinition of what a university is. It redefines a university by saying that no longer will a university be required to have an ambit of courses that is wide enough for it to claim university status. Institutions can set themselves up with a very, very narrow focus. There's no requirement on those institutions to have a minimum level of quality of library provision or other standards of provision either. In other words, there will be a drive towards the creation of teacher-only institutions that will enable for-profit corporations to come into the sector to take advantage of the state funding of tuition fees. The competition between all the new providers for those students at the bottom of the heap, from the poorest backgrounds, who are debt averse because they can't face the prospect of the high debts that they will encounter during their education and have to pay in the future, will produce a competition between institutions to provide the cheapest degrees that, are, that can be made available. And what will that mean? That will mean high staff uh, student staff ratios. That says it round the wrong way. In other words, more students per member of staff, reducing the quantity and quality of contact time between students and staff, moving towards the provision of teaching via hourly paid contracts rather than properly contracted staff doing research. It will be a move in those sectors of the higher education sector to vocational skills training and away from traditional higher education. Um, in other words, degrees will be issued for that vocational skill. Um, and what's the consequence of that? Well, the consequence of that is that a too tightly focused vocational education reduces rather than increases the flexibility of any future workforce and therefore will have ramifications for the equality and flexibility and social mobility in society. Now, if you think that this is only going to be a slow and gradual process, let me disabuse you of that. Between 2010-11 and 2013-14, in that short period, the number of students in this for-profit sector increased from 7,000 to no less than 53,000. And the amount of money that the institutions that were providing that education received increased from 50 million pounds to 675 million pounds. And if you think that that's uh, some kind of democratic expansion that increases uh, variety, let me disabuse you of that as well. 40%, half of that, not just 40%, 40, half of that was accounted for by five single corporations that were taking um, those, that income and th using those resources. 40% of the students, by the way, who go into these private providers up to now have been EU students. Of course, that does mean that the government has a major problem, Brexit meaning that it is highly unlikely that the same expectation 
of a British higher education will be harboured in the breasts of many EU students in the future. The evidence that is available, and it is only circumstantial at the moment, the evidence that comes from whistleblowers that actually work in these private providers, is that precisely the same desperate measures of recruitment are continuing in Britain now as have been characteristic of higher education recruitment in the United States for the past decades. Effectively, dragging anyone and everyone who can be persuaded to shoulder debt to come in and do a degree for as cheap as possible, but shouldering them with debts in the future, which they will have to pay back, but for qualifications that will be treated by employers as second or even as third rate. I was going to go on to talk about fees and loans, but I think I've been speaking uh, a little bit too long, so I'm going to skip, it, skip that and move straight to the question of inequality. We live in a society today which is more unequal than it has been for 40 years. Now, the justification that governments give for a fee loan regime that indebts students in the way that this does is that the premium that comes from a lifetime income if you've got a degree means that it's worth your while buying in to an expensive degree program in order to get that lifetime income premium. The reality is that what this bill will do is to reinforce rather than reduce those inequalities. In fact, already when one sees what the current debt regime for students represents, you can see the way that even now it's the case that students who come from richer backgrounds who therefore don't delay the repayment of their loan, or maybe even don't take out a loan at all, are paying back far less than those students who actually have to pay back the loan over an extended period of time. You also have an unfairness to the indebted graduates who both pay back their loans in the future, and at the same time will have to pay the taxes to cover the debts of other students that have to be written off by the government. That's the effect that is going to be worsened by the Higher Education Research Bill. And then there's the question of governance. What is it that this bill says about how universities are governed in relation to the teaching function, the research function, and the freedom of inquiry, the academic freedom that anything deserving of the name of a university needs to have? The bill says nothing. Or rather, in saying nothing about governance particularly, what it actually does is put the power to run these future higher education corporations not into the hands of academic staff, but into the hands of the chief executive officers that run them. This bill represents an attempt to transform students' unions from representational organisations to entertainment and care providers, and it is the subtext of it is an attack on the political role of the National Union of <coughs> Students as the representative body. The bill does grant autonomy. It grants autonomy, but not to the academics that design courses and do research. It grants autonomy to the institutions. Not to the institutions as governed by their academic boards, but specifically to the chief executive officers who run them. And the last thing I want to speak about is teaching quality. If I haven't persuaded you already that this bill represents the exact reverse of what any respectable higher education system should expect from its political leadership, then think about the claim that this bill will transform the structure of higher education in order to improve teaching. Improve it from what, by the way? Improve it from what the government claims is lamentable levels of quality of teaching in education, but without providing any evidence that that's the case. You can almost hear the Tory Shire MP listening to the whinging in the saloon bar somewhere in the home counties as somebody complains bitterly that their son or daughter has come back and said that the lecture was boring or that they got uh, a poor mark for their recent dissertation. What evidence does the government have? None for this. One of the things it talks about a lot is low pass rates that some universities or some departments or some degrees in some departments have. 
but without asking any questions about what the recruitment policy to those departments was. It speaks about retention rates, students who stay on to finish their degrees, but without asking any questions about in what way student retention has been affected by student poverty, the terrible levels of poverty that some students face, particularly as a result of some of the rents that are being charged these days by universities in their halls of residence. What does the bill say? Well, the bill says the teaching excellence frameworks, the TEF, as it's called, will raise teaching standards. But how will it do that? Because the teaching excellence framework doesn't measure teaching quality at all. The measures of the TEF are entirely proxy measures. There's no direct measurement of teaching quality being proposed. Um, what the proxy measures and metrics of the teaching excellence framework make reference to is a question of levels of student satisfaction. But levels of student satisfaction as reported are closely related and all the evidence, the academic evidence, published evidence shows that this is closely related to the ease of courses and the ease of gaining high marks in courses for assessed work. And all one has to do is think of the inadequacies of the design of the National Student Survey and you can see why that might be the case. Student retention is heavily dependent on non-educational factors, which will cut, notice, against widening participation in, in universities. If a university's quality is being measured by student retention, and if widening participation means the recruitment of students who might be more likely not to finish the course, the logic for an institution is obvious. Don't recruit more widely. Concentrate your recruitment only on those students who are likely to finish their courses. And remember that postgraduate employment, which is the third of the metrics that have been spoken about in respect of the teaching excellent framework, the postgraduate employment opportunities for students, what, they, what job you actually get, all the evidence shows, and the evidence and the citation of the, re, the references for that evidence are the, in, in the alternative white paper, if you care to buy one and, and to read it, Postgraduate employment does not depend primarily on educational attainment. It depends primarily on the social networks that people already have. In other words, the background, the social background from which they come. And if that doesn't persuade you, think finally of this. At the moment, something in the region of 8% of the total budget of all universities is spent on quality assessment. How much is that? 1.1 billion pounds. The introduction of the teaching excellence framework can do nothing else but dramatically increase the amount of university income that is spent not on improving teaching, but on the bureaucratic exercise of measuring its quality and trying to do an assurance of it. My estimate is that that could reach in the region of half a billion, taken across all the 160 higher education institutions in the whole sector, raising the total cost of quality assurance from 1.1 billion pounds to 1.6 billion pounds. And that means that that money has to come from somewhere. From where does it come? I can tell you when where it will come. It will come from the teaching budget. And how will, get, how will universities manage their teaching budget to squeeze out that for the assurance purposes that the teaching excellence frameworks demand, it will shift people from properly academic contracts onto casual contracts, onto hourly paid lecturers. It will seek to get postgraduate to teaching done, postgraduate students to do the teaching rather than properly contracted staff. In other words, this bill, when it claims that it puts students at the center of the educational system and that it's concerned about the quality of teaching is an imposture and it's up to us to underscore that for the government and to oppose it in any way that we can. That's enough.